Hello, and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for listening today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. Since at least the time of Aristotle, very wise people have been telling us to be true to ourselves, to line up the person we are on the outside with the person we are on the inside. In a word, to be authentic. And when I was initially planning for this episode, I thought, perhaps a bit naively, that we'd just parrot that. Hey, here are some ways that you can get more in touch with yourself and become more authentic. But what is authenticity, really? What does it mean to be who we are or get in touch with ourselves or to go full new age here for a moment, to live in alignment with our higher purpose? Do we even have some kind of a true self that we can be authentic to? Maybe being authentic is just about living from our values or imagining a more fully realized and aspirational version of ourselves and trying to be more that way. But if we're doing that, whose values are we choosing? Where are those values coming from? And as long as we're here, is there really much of a difference between feeling authentic and just feeling good about ourselves? And hey, is it even a good thing to be authentic in the first place? As I prepared for this episode, I learned just how deep the rabbit hole went here. So to help me find the bottom of it, I'm joined today by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best-selling author, and he's my dad. So dad, thanks for doing this with me today. How are you doing? I'm excited. As we go spelunking in our cave diving, (laughs) I'm going to keep my headlamp on and hopefully leave a trail of breadcrumbs behind us so that we can find our way out again. So during this episode, here's some things that I want to cover for people. First, what do we mean by authenticity, including different ways to think about authenticity? Then second, that question I asked during the intro, is being authentic a good thing? And then third, when we're being authentic, what are we being authentic to? Which I think is a really, really interesting question. Like, what is it in us that we're, that we're trying to get more to be out of us, mm. for lack of a better way of putting it? Um, And then maybe we'll talk a little bit about the role of aspiration or values in this and what are authentic aspirations and what aren't. And then maybe we're going to close with just kind of a simpler way to think about this whole territory. But I want to start by asking you, Dad, how do you think about authenticity? (laughs) Layman's terms, 35 years working in clinical practice with people, if not more than that. Like, how do you approach this territory? Well, first, I want to say that I approached it initially, much like you said, with this kind of naive sense that, well, authentic, fake. All right, that's straightforward. Not at all. And one of the great benefits of the deep dive that you've done into the academic literature is to surface a lot of the complexities. So on reflection, I come at this, I would say, kind of through two... um, lenses. My first lens is cultural and had to do, has to do with where I am in the lifespan. So I was born in the early 1950s and there was a backlash coming through the 50s with the beat poets and then full speed with the counterculture in the 60s and 70s, a kind of resistance to the sense of social masks, social uniforms, um, books coming out, the man in the gray flannel suit. And there was a strong cultural emphasis on more, let it hang out, quote unquote, be your whole self out loud. So I come at it a little bit from that perspective. So there's so there's a certain positive valence on so-called being authentic. Second, I really come at it from the long perspective of a therapist Yeah, in which a lot of what brings people to therapy and and it creates issues for people in general is I would say three things that relate to this territory of authenticity that are kind of related to our actual experience. I'll name them. And then I know we're going to get into the academics for a while. The first is that sometimes for people, there's a kind of conflict or tension between the face they feel they must show to the world and what they're really feeling inside. For example, they may have to look like they're perfectly fine with the, their boss, you know, swatting them on the tush as he walks by. But deep down mm-hmm. inside, they've had it up yeah. here with that. So authenticity is about, you know, grappling with that kind of an issue. Another one is what you do with people who are in roles of various kinds that are not fulfilling deep and important and, and understandable needs that they have. So again, there's a disconnect between outer performance or presentation and then inner inner depths. 
And then third kind of issue is one in which people have a deep down longing or aspiration or form of actualizing themselves um, that is really important to them that has gotten postponed day after day, year after year, maybe for good reasons, but it feels like there's a disconnect between what really is wanting to be lived from fully and the outer expression in the world that is mandated or they feel is only that which is allowed. And so these are examples, these three examples that might start to ring true for people who are listening here about how this topic that we're going to be exploring could have a lot of personal relevance. Yeah, and I think that it's really interesting just even how you're framing this, Dad, where it's much more about the subjective experience of the person. They have a feeling inside of themselves that, that something's not quite right if that makes sense, to like really simplify what you're saying. There, there's some unalignment between what's going on inside of them and the way that they have to be externally. But in the scientific literature, people need to come up with constructs that they can measure. Mm. That's one of the big things that we're doing when we're sciencing. We're measuring stuff. And so when people tried to figure out how to think about authenticity in that more... Um, structural framework maybe, or that more kind of specific framework, really what they tend to focus on is this idea of congruence. Basically, how similar is a person's external behavior to their internal stuff, their attitudes, their beliefs, their, their motivations, their values, all of that kind of stuff, like how connected is it? And some of the information that I'm going to pull for this episode comes from one particular uh, just kind of review of the research. It wasn't really itself a piece of research, I don't think, but it was just an assessment of the field. It's called The Enigma of Being Yourself, A Critical Examination of the Concept of Authenticity. And that was published in 2019, if you want to look it up. And in particular, when we think about authenticity in the research, there's this focus on behavior, right? And what you see really quickly when you start looking at is it good to be authentic or is authenticity of value when you're talking about that behavioral part of it and particularly behavioral alignment between the outside and the inside is a lot of people's values are not great. <laughs> like they're anti-social values, they're problematic. We have this whole uh, swirling mess of different desires and wants and needs inside of ourselves that it can be really complicated to get to the bottom of. And so we really quickly get to a question, like, do we actually want people behaving congruently in terms of how they express themselves out in the world with how they feel inside of themselves? And that's one of the big stumbling blocks that you come to very early on in this process when you start talking about authenticity, and particularly authenticity as a value. So authenticity is not an unalloyed good. In other words, it requires some regulation. Yeah. Yeah. Authentically, somebody cuts me off in traffic and I really might have the urge to just yank my wheel a little bit to the side and give their car a big whack. But happily, I don't act out that genuine impulse that's been arising me in the moment. Does that mean I'm a big phony? I don't think so. It just means I'm, you know, a a sufficiently well-regulated driver. The second thing I want to say is that partly coming out of my own countercultural roots and so forth, it's easy for issues of authenticity to be framed as a criticism, uh, including criticisms that are are along the lines of, oh, that person's a big phony. Mm -hmm. And I really Mm -hmm. don't mean it that way. I really, really don't mean it that way. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, Well, maybe, okay, few people do, but nobody, very few people wake (laughs) up in the morning and say, I'm going to con the world today, right? I'm going to trick them uh, and fool them and basically lie my way through my day. People don't do that. If there's a disconnect, a gap between the presentation of a person, what they say and how they say it and the emotional tone around it, if there's a significant, for them, meaningful gap between that and what's going on inside in the the messy, complicated inner zoo. Uh, It's usually because they don't, haven't had a choice. They haven't felt like they've had a choice. Uh, They learned to acquire that persona, that presentation. And um, then the larger question becomes really pragmatic. 
in certain situations, it's completely appropriate to put on a false face that's really at odds with how you really, really feel, let's just, such as when someone is coming at you in a dominant structure in which it's not safe or wise for you to reveal what's really going on. So you may have to put on an act to get through that job you've got or that dinner with the in-laws. All right. The interesting question for me, and then I'll see what you make of it, is consider a kind of a range of what would be, what is authentic for you. And then in terms of that range, how free can we be in our selection of that range that's appropriate to our situations and good for us as well, right? Yeah. And that to me is kind of the journey, which is definitely a journey in, that I've been on, um, of becoming you know, more at ease in one's own skin, more relaxed about who one is, more able to be fully expressed as appropriate, more self-disclosed when it's appropriate through regulating oneself and being able to select, to choose within the range of what's authentic, what would be appropriate. Yeah, I think that you're highlighting something really important here, Dad, and to kind of skip to the end of what we're gonna be talking about today, I think that that freedom that you're pointing to, you know, agency to use yeah. the word that I just can't get away from, is kind of the secret sauce here of authenticity. Mm. It's what we're really talking about when we talk about authenticity. And we use all these other words, but what we mean is freedom of choice. Do you have a part of yourself inside that you feel like you can choose and that you feel good about that choice? Because to your point, part of life is about making choices that align with what other people are doing socially or about maybe getting ahead in life in different kinds of ways that are you know, not inappropriate. They're just part of the game we're kind of all playing here. And you want to be able to make those choices too. When you, when you feel so called to. But you also want to have the capacity to drop the mask and really go into that full, as you said the other day, to make kind of skin-to-skin -skin contact psycho-emotionally with another person. And I think that many people feel very stymied in that um, because we have all of these various impediments to it. The fears that we have, our, our um, desire to connect with others that competes with our fears of what might become of that connection, uh, the dreaded experience to talk about something that we've named on the podcast in the past, all of those little bits and pieces. But something that I want to just say really quickly here before we move on is that I think that like, just be true to yourself, dude, is kind of the new age version of I'm just being honest, man. <laughs> it's like, well, just because you're being honest doesn't make you not an asshole. And <laughs> I, I think that that's just like a really important distinction here in all of this. Um, like the fact that you believe what you're saying doesn't mean that you should be saying it. And I, I don't want to fall into the trap in this conversation of just like telling everyone to just be more authentic. And I think that part of what we're trying to do here is be a little bit more nuanced about how we frame and think about authenticity. Because also, frankly, like a functional society is based on checks on people's behavior like at least to some extent, right? Even the most pathological libertarian out there wants there to be some rules that govern behavior. They just don't want anyone telling them what to do. Um, and so I think that that's also kind of a useful piece to this thing. Because often when we think about authenticity, we think about doing what uh, we have inside of us externally mm -hmm. without being as influenced by external factors. But man, I actually want some external factors to be influencing people's behavior from time to time here. How about we each nominate an example, okay? So I would say that when I was a kid, uh, I was aware of my feelings, but mm. it was extraordinarily difficult for me to actually express them. And at the upper bound, I could name them maybe, but to feel sad while I was describing my sadness or to feel hurt while I was describing my hurt, uh, that was really, really, really hard for me. Uh, and so there was a general process of reclaiming, as it were, my interior and becoming more and more comfortable with appropriately expressing it. That it wasn't that I was phony baloney, it's just that my presentation left out and nobody could tell that behind this seemingly confident, perfectly fine, nerdy kid was a lot of unhappiness and a lot of anxiety about being with people and a lot of unfulfilled longings inside. 
So I think of authenticity in that frame. How about you? Do you have an example that could ground this? I think what comes up for me when you ask that is actually some IFS stuff. I think that I had a really overdeveloped manager for most of my life Mm. to use internal family systems terminology, a manager being kind of the part of your personality that, uh, that keeps the trains running on time typically more logical. It doesn't have to be, but typically. And we've talked about this a bit on the podcast in the past, but just my own personal story around being a pretty heady person who was rewarded for being heady, really wanted to connect with other people emotionally, but to your point, felt very stymied in that connection pretty early on. And so I remember being a teenager and having all of these desires or urges or wants around like real emotional sitting in it with another person. And I could just never find the skeleton key to get there. Mm. I just I just couldn't, I didn't know how to how to tap my head and rub my belly at the same time to make that kind of an interaction happen with another person. Um, but I think what's so interesting about this is that the way I was being was not quote unquote inauthentic. Right. Be- because it was authentic to like a part of who I was. Right. But it didn't include the the whole of it. Yeah. Um, and there were particularly these key parts of me that were really getting masked out, mm. almost like masking in Photoshop, if you ever do that, that were just getting yeah. masked out of the picture. Mm. And I think that it led to people understandably having a view of me that was very one-dimensional for a big chunk of my life. Um, And then I had to go through like a very deliberate process of, okay, how do you learn how to do that dance with another person in a way that feels safe for you? Does that kind of answer your question, Dad? And do you have any thoughts about it? Oh, it's a good answer. Yeah. It it gets also right there at um, the relevance of this topic, quote unquote, authenticity, um, for our important personal relationships. Yeah. And to be perfectly clear, There's a place for uh, just giving others minimal information and leaving out all kinds of things that are true because it's just not appropriate to the situation. You don't want to have that relationship with that person, whatever. Totally. Yeah. Where it's off topic, this is not the time to spill your guts on the boardroom. Um, You just, you're there for other reasons. Okay. Definitely a place for that. On the other hand, there's, I think, a fair amount of evidence that especially in friendships, significant family relationships, love relationships, that uh, self-disclosure is, mm. a, is a factor of, of intimacy. And for one, I uh, can think of all kinds of relationships in which the presenting complaint when the couple walks through my door is person A and person B. Person A essentially says something along the lines of, I don't feel like I know you anymore to person B. Mm-hmm. Or I know you love me, but I kind of feel like we're drifting apart. And uh, it seems like there's just so much to you that's kind of kept out of sight. You don't want me to be a part of. Yeah. And that makes me feel less important to you and, and left in the dark. And it's not that I want to control and manipulate you, but mm-hmm. it's it's kind of like you you seem afraid to let down your guard and um, open up more to me. Could yeah. we do that? Yeah. A, a phrase that I've heard you use in the, the past, Dad, um, is uh, you feel like you're talking to somebody's agent or uh-huh. the two couple, right. the couple was in the room with you and one of them, it kind of felt like their their lawyer was talking while they were talking, while was, uh, the other yeah. person was being a little bit more revealed. Does, is, yeah, that that's sense? a good way yeah. to put it. Yeah. And so that's some that's a place where it shows up too. Can we yeah. be more revealed as appropriate to each other. I think about the line from Almost Famous, right? Uh, something like the the only real currency in this world is is what we communicate to each other when we're not trying to be cool. Yeah, yeah. Kind of close to that. Yeah, and, and often those kinds of uh, layers that don't get so revealed uh, are the softer, more vulnerable ones. Yeah, totally. Also, sometimes they have to do with important desires or needs that are kind of left, that have been left behind somehow in the relationship that, you know, the per- one person is, is trying to increasingly express and foreground. I think what we're talking about here really gets to one of the, 
the big issues that can come up with authenticity, this notion of like, what are we being authentic to? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time, again, when people have just a colloquial conversation about authenticity, there's this sort of suggestion, it can be kind of implicit in it, that a person has a true self. And if they were just more that true self out in the world, things would go better for them. Mm -hmm. their, their life would be more in alignment with their higher purpose and they would be more authentic with other people and you know the, the seas would part. But I think that what we're, what we're saying here is that we have a lot of different selves inside of us. We have a lot of different values and desires and parts. You were talking just using your example of being on the freeway. There's a part of you that yeah. wants to sideswipe that person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a bigger part of you, thankfully, that doesn't want to sideswipe that person. But these are both authentic impulses that you're having. Like yeah. when I was talking about my masking, you know, my masking was a part of myself. It wasn't like this diffuse entity that was making me do something. No, it was true to me too. But it was just, a, it was like I had the, the Popeye right bicep and, you know, a little flimsy left bicep. I was overdeveloped and I was over constrained. Um, and so I just want to kind of make that part of this conversation too, that there are multiple different impulses or parts or pieces that you can be authentic to. And again, we're just trying to be more at choice about which of those versions of ourself we're putting on the table in a given interaction. Right here, we have the value of self-acceptance. When different important parts of ourselves uh, are disowned or suppressed, they're pushed out of conscious awareness, they don't go away. They often, they fester and then they leak out and then they sometimes explode out, out of the cave that we've pushed them in. And that's problematic. And I, I think a lot of uh, kind of a central wisdom in psychoanalysis was this notion of bringing the two great tools of the physician to our own psyche, light and air. Mm. We unpack things, we air it out, we bring sunlight to it, we bring it into the light of day. Now, to do that, we must also add regulation. There's, it's appropriate to include regulation, but so that we're, let's say, aware of this kind of violent rage impulse arising that feels root, just rooted in our own biology, let alone based on, you know, cultural training. Can you include that? Mm -hmm. Can you recognize that that uh, raging force is in one of the rooms in the mansion of your mind without letting it overtake the whole house? All right, that's the balance we're talking about. Okay, so I think that that's a great place to kind of summarize what we've talked about so far, because we've mostly focused on issues with the kind of conventional notion of authenticity. Uh, authenticity, as we talk about it colloquially, often includes some kind of unified true self. We're not totally sure that that's a thing. It often includes a notion that authenticity is just like a good thing and we should all aspire to be more authentic. And it's like, well, maybe not all the time, not for all people, not in all situations. And then there's this notion in it of behavioral congruence, where we're trying to behave on the outside the way we really are, whatever that means, on the inside. And what I think is really helpful to actually focus on here is what you said at the very beginning, Dad, which are those different feelings of kind of subjective authenticity. What seems true about us to us? And can we kind of go through a process of discovering that or uncovering that more? And this often includes, I think, two different things that I want to focus on for the rest of the conversation. First, um, clearing the pipes, removing our defensiveness, uh, mm -hmm. removing those impediments that we were talking about to healthy forms of self-expression on the one hand. Maybe we can talk about that as uh, being authentic, you know, revealing the interior more. And then there's this other piece of it that I think sometimes gets kind of missed, which is just like an aspirational element. Because a lot of the time, if you think about when people talk about feeling authentic and they report on, yeah, I felt really authentic then, what they were feeling authentic to is often not really so much this notion of like, my behavior was really congruent between the outside and the inside. It's much more aspirational most of the time when people talk about it. They felt really good about what they did because they felt like some true to themselves aspect really emerged from them in that moment. 
And it was maybe even a version of themselves that's in like the top 10% of that distribution you were talking about, Dad, of like what's authentic for them. They really kind of stretched, but it felt good and it felt right, which is inherently aspirational. And I think that that's kind of like becoming more authentic, if that makes sense. So there's this little distinction between kind of being on the one hand, revealing how we are right now, and then becoming on the other, kind of trying to step a little bit into a still true to ourself, but slightly more, choose your word, a slightly more realized version of ourself here. So what do you think about that? I'm leery of the degree to which people put on a mask, a terminology sometimes is used is false self persona. So sometimes I think people adopt e various ego ideals that are aspirational. Often they come in from society and that feeds into their mask, but the mm, mask mm -hmm. is not really true to them. And that's where I think the range idea is really, really yeah. useful. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm I'm a little careful about this whole idea of you know, ideals we set for ourselves, the standards we set for ourselves. Yeah, the aspirational aspect of yeah. it. When we were talking about it the other day, that was where you you raised some, I think, pretty thoughtful and really helped me reorganize my thinking kind of questions about it in terms of like, well, whose ideals are we picking here? And yeah. what ideals are we targeting? And do we feel good because we're being authentic or do we feel good because we've aligned ourselves with like the social or cultural milieu in a way that like feels safe? And and I think that's a really good question here for sure. Yeah. And uh, so we're dealing with things like the shoulds hmm. that people have internalized or to use a certain kind of terminology, being a good boy or a good girl. Sure. And just the tone on that, you yeah. can see the ways in which there's an understanding that that you know there's a place for being good and there's a thing about it that it's gone too far. It, it starts to feel kind of uh, imposed upon oneself. And then on the other hand, we have all this id stuff that Freud was talking about, road rage, other kinds of impulses, seething away in the basement. And how do we manage that? But there's something about it that's really real. And it seems to me that... Um, Developing inner resources like self-compassion, self-regulation, mindfulness uh, are really central because the more you have those by your side, the more that you can go into the basement and open the doors and without being overwhelmed by what comes out. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, and over time, I, I do think there is a psychological value in accessing the entirety of your own psyche. Um, so I'm biased that way. And I, I think you know, I, I don't know, again, if there's a scientific study, because how would you really measure that? Yeah, But experientially, people just start talking about over time, I began feeling more more whole, more complete, more in touch with myself, and, and, and more accepting of the kind of unruly mob. <laughs> you know, that's definitely a part of me, but also maybe better at managing it. And paradoxically, the more I... I grew to accept it. And the more that I opened those doors, the less that stuff was happening in business meetings and relationships, especially in the heat of the moment, that got me into trouble. Well, you've done some fantastic podcasting here, Dad, because you really set me up beautifully for this transition. Uh, while I was digging into this stuff, I bumped inevitably into the work of Carl Rogers, uh, sort of the, the, yeah. the father of humanistic psychology, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and a, a wonderful clinician and a great thinker about this whole thing who has had probably as much influence as any single individual over Western psychology in the last hundred years or so. And he had this notion of these two versions of the self, because the word ideal, as you were talking about dad, is like really tricky. And he also used the phrase ideal self. And so his notion was that people walk into the room when they first start doing therapy, and they've got a perceived self. This is how the person sees themselves. Right. And then there's this other thing that they're kind of shooting for, which is how the person wishes to be. And Rogers used the language ideal self for that. And again, that word ideal is a little tricky, but here's what he actually meant. So I went to On Becoming a Person, which is one of his big books. Um, and it's a wonderful piece, would recommend it to anyone who's interested in this. And this is what he wrote as his description of the results of good therapy. 
The client changes and reorganizes his concept of himself. And of course, this was gendered language because it was the 60s, but there we are. He moves away from perceiving himself as unacceptable to himself, as unworthy of respect, as having to live by the standards of others. He moves toward a conception of himself as a person of worth, as a self-directing person, able to form his standards and values upon the basis of his own experience. So authenticity right there, right? He develops much more positive attitudes towards himself. He becomes less defensive and hence more open to his experience of himself and of others. Then finally, the initial discrepancy between the self that he is and the self that he wants to be is greatly diminished. So that was his framing of an ideal self. But I think it's almost entirely consistent with what you were describing there, Dad, including all of your squeamishness about the notion of like an, an, an external ideal, right? Because it's really talking more about that kind of congruence, that alignment, that, that drop in the mask, clear in the pipes, uh, getting to some, some version of yourself where you feel like you can make your own choices. And, and where those choices are being driven by what you fundamentally care about, as opposed to all of those different notions that you've sort of internalized that come in externally. Do you think that that's fair? Yeah, and I think that Rogers probably meant that the self that the client wants to be is the self who the client was all along. Yeah, and that's a very humanistic psychology theory that like <laughs> if you just clear away the the external BS that we all deal with, every person is kind of like a unique and beautiful flower and can become fully realized and is actually that way deep down underneath, to your point. Yeah, that's that's right. And I think that's actually true. And and I think also culturally, um Rogers was like I said at the beginning, coming out of the 50s and early 60s, yeah. mm -hmm. in, and in which there just were a lot of rules about how you had to be. Uh, so a lot of them were gender normative. So norms vary. That said, I think part of the backdrop here in America is our preoccupation with image and with, have, and with being a personal brand and selling ourselves out there in the marketplace. And a kind of subtle poison starts creeping into the mind that makes you feel like you're not good enough already as you are. Uh, and a kind of poison creeps into relationships where you wonder, what are they selling? Uh, what, are they, what are they performing? Why do they feel like they have to perform? I don't want to feel like an audience. I want to feel like an intimate. I want to feel like a friend, someone that you can actually just drop it you know, drop the performance. Ugh. So, you know, that's kind of in the yeah. context here yeah. uh, of this exploration of authenticity. So after all of that, I want to talk a little bit with you about what's actually really healthy for people, that top end of the range, and how can we develop that over time? And so as we were talking the other day, you actually shared, I think, a really great story that's a really appropriate example here. And I would just love if you shared it again on the podcast, if that's okay with you. This gets at the question of, is it authentic to try to improve yourself? And what is the ideal self to do? So I shared with you that starting around 10 years ago, uh, I began focusing more on, uh, as practice, being increasingly rested in a felt sense of warm-heartedness, kindness, compassion, and love. And to return to that place more and more rapidly when I was miffed or stressed, and to express it more and more with other people. And that connects to my own larger spiritual practice and, and the ways in which great teachers have generally encouraged that path uh, in a whole range of traditions. All right. And it's not that I'm great. It's just, yeah, work in progress. And what's interesting is that in that journey, which started with a certain amount of top-down regulation of what was unloving, <laughs> <laughs> and a kind of encouragement for, you know, the, come on, come on, Rick, come on, you can rest in a more forgiving, warmer place here. What became more and more evident and it brought me home to, going all the way back to being a little boy, is the ways that I'm naturally, and I think that little boy mm -hmm. way down deep, is naturally actually really tender and benevolent and pro-social and doesn't want to hurt anybody at all. And it's just inherently 
unabashedly loving being. The journey, in effect, was to aspire to develop something in the process of which there's been a kind of uncovering and a return to what's actually been really always the case, but covered over and hindered and obstructed, et cetera, and veiled, always been the case way down deep already inside. And what I love about that story is that your your deliberate pursuit of something led to the realization that it was there the whole time. Yeah. And so we're not telling people to create some idealized, heavily masked, movie star version of themselves that they aspire after. That's probably not actually authentic. So what's the alternative? And I think that we come back to what I said a little bit ago, this notion of being and becoming. On the one hand, being authentic, which we can think about as just reducing act broadly, dropping the mask, clearing the impediments, all of that. And then becoming authentic. Uh, Authenticity is a form of self-realization, is how Mm. I would put it. And when we're doing that, we're targeting the top of the authentic range of what matters to us. And there are a lot of different things that we've talked about in the five-year, six-year, whatever it is at this point, history of the podcast, that relate to these two different things. Um, But I would love here, Dan, if we talked a little bit about how practically you've seen people kind of go through this process, maybe working with somebody who you saw them go from being more um, more masked, more inhibited, more in the false self, more in the scared self, and then over time come to something that felt more rested and true to them. Um, like what are some of the processes that people might go through as part of that uh, that adventure? One is to be with people who bring to you what Carl Rogers talked about as unconditional positive regard. Yeah, I love that. They're fully accepting. Being around people like that starts to give you the feeling that you can let your hair down and be more real. Uh, I think I've thought often about a teacher, I can't recall his name in high school, who just had an open classroom during lunch and he'd sit there with his lunch and a book, and some of his kids would roll in, and he would just talk with us. And he talked with me, and I could tell I I was such a squirrely kid. I was so squirrely. You know, I am a 10th grader, you know, and I'm young and everything. And and he was just natural. I could be natural. There was a benevolent benevolence. It wasn't merely neutral. It was positive regard that sees clearly, certainly, and sees people's issues. Um, and is not giving people a moral pass for problems, but it has that quality to it. So being around people who can give you that or and ask for one step more of that and offering that to others, that's really helpful. A second thing, and then I'll see what you think about it here, is to get more in touch with body sensations. Mm -hmm. Body sensations underlie typically that which is warded off. Um, desires that we push away, emotions that we push away, getting in touch with your body. And that's directly accessible. When people say, oh, I'm in my head, I'm out of touch, you know, I'm blocked from the neck down. I say, be aware of internal body sensations, breathing, your body altogether, the sense of your body moving in space. And that's a great way to come to get more inclusive and accepting of Mm -hmm. the whole of yourself. Yeah. So two so far. What do you think? Yeah, I love both of them. Uh, as a quick note, physical sensations are faster than thought by and large, just in terms of like how long it takes the thing to fire or the, you know, the neuron to receive the uh, information. Yeah. Um, and so thought, we we can have a lot of inhibition around, and we can have inhibition around physical sensations yeah. as well, of course, but it tends to be less present and it's less psychologically driven when we have those physical sensation inhibitions. So it can be a way to kind of like get around the manager part of the brain is paying attention to what your body sensation is telling you. Yeah. Um, for me, I think that's so much of this, so much of the being part of it, a bit the becoming part of it too, but so much of the being part gets to fear. Mm, and it gets to what right. are we afraid of? What experiences are we avoiding? For me as a anxiety-driven person, as I've talked about a lot, What's making me nervous? What's the stepping out of the comfort zone? Where am I comfortable? Where am I not? And so essentially everything we've ever talked about on the podcast about dealing with anxiety and managing fear, I think is just a huge piece of this puzzle. That's right. Including an episode we did a a while back, a number of years ago, on specifically the dreaded experience. We might uh, revive that one and do another 
episode on it because I think it's just such a cool idea. Yeah, that's great. A couple others really come out here. Um, another one, another way to help yourself be more integrated, whole, at ease, et cetera, um, is to uh, name to yourself what you're feeling. You may not be appropriate yet, or you may not know how to name it to the world, but to actually just simply in a neutral way, basic mindfulness, you know, note send, you know, what, what's actually going on in your own stream of consciousness. And that will help you get more in touch with it, which over time will then be a foundation for being able to be more transparent and disclosed about it with others. Whatever's there, but doing it for yourself. That's, that's a really useful thing. And then another thing, um, and I'm, I'm really very curious about this about you. Sure, yeah. So I generate a fair amount of language, but under that track is, for me, my predominant inner life, which is full of imagery and sensation mm. and emotion. It's pretty nonverbal. And uh, so one way in also for a person is to get a sense of themselves as like uh, a, a very large space. And there are different metaphors that you can use for this. A very large space in which, for example, there are many characters. So that's parts work. So who are the characters? Who's in that inner world? Another version of this, for me that's very image oriented, is to get a sense of your whole psyche as like a vast land that you were endowed with at birth. And over time, many of us kind of withdrew to the gatekeeper's house, as it were, on this vast estate. And that's where we live, bunkered up and looking out through the windows. And instead, can you imagine what are the provinces out there? You know, what are the lands out there? The swamps, the meadows, uh, where are there, you know, what's out there, right? All of who you are. And can you have more of a sense of kind of encompassing and being the whole the whole country you are, rather than living only from the capital city. Mm, yeah, yeah, I love that. And I, I got kind of, just as you were talking about, you have a, a nonverbal track that's mm -hmm. running in you that, you know, caused me to look inside and be like, wait, what, you know, what is going on there? And, and maybe spurred on by that a little bit, because I, I, I am a pretty internal monologue person. Uh, most of my feelings are expressed as as verbal thoughts internally. Mm. I've got a very strong internal monologue. Um, like I think to myself and it's like I'm having a conversation, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of other people, including my partner, yeah. Elizabeth, don't have an internal monologue at all. It's just, you know, they're just quiet inside. So they have to actually talk to themselves externally sometimes in order to get that kind of a sensation. Yeah. Um, for me, what I kind of found in there as you were talking is is just the idea of like self-honesty. Mm -hmm. Because I think that we have to be honest with ourselves before we're able to be honest with other people. Yeah. And when I was talking about my story earlier, I think I was always pretty honest with myself. I always kind of knew that there was a part of myself that was vulnerable or emotional or wanted that relationality. It was really kind of hungering for something that it wasn't really getting. Um, that my behavior wasn't leading to, to take responsibility for it. But I also think that there are a lot of people, um, including myself from time to time about different things, who are just not that honest with themselves. They haven't mm -hmm. been able to get to the place where they can admit to themselves that there is a part of them that isn't being included. Yeah. There's a part of them that isn't flowing. There's a part of them that's being left out. And... I think the practical how of that, maybe like in therapy, can be a long and arduous process that is not really intuitive, and it's kind of hard to lay out for people like how you do that. Um, I think reducing defensiveness is a huge part of it and being able to go through that process. But that's sort of what I would highlight is like you have to tell the truth to yourself before you can tell it to anybody else. Deeply true. Being kind of blunt here, three questions that I think are really useful. Mm, love this, yeah. One is, have I been feeling something that would be good for me to express more? And then you're into the how of expressing it, the appropriateness of it. But basically, we start from, yeah, I really have been feeling something that would be important for me to communicate more, not just know more to myself. 
but to allow it to be more apparent on the on on the outside of me, as it were, that other people see. Okay, because part of what we're talking about here is what is it about ourselves that other people see, and how do we regulate what other people see in healthy ways? We can be underregulated or overregulated, and I think we're talking about authenticity as the sweet spot in which we're appropriately regulated in terms of what other people see. Okay. Uh, second question, is there something I'm needing or deeply wanting that would be really good to bring more into the public space, to, to bring more outside myself so that significant people in my life know about it and I just act upon it in more obvious ways. I actually act on the basis of that need or that value, you know, in, in direct ways. Is there something mm. that you really, you need that's not being met enough in your current situation that it would serve you to express more in various ways? Need. Mm. And then third, is there something that you, um, is there an aspiration in you? Is there an expression of you, an actualization of you? a fulfillment of yourself that's been uh, sidelined that would be good to foreground more and express more into the space between you and other people and to live more from and be visible as living more from whatever that is to actualize more out there in the world. Those are three questions that kind of really bring it home, right? Yeah. Feelings, needs, and you know, aspirations. So at the end here, maybe focusing more on that aspirational kind of becoming part of it, something that seems so true to me and, and so obvious probably to everybody who's listening to this is the, the value of a secure base of operations uh -huh. for any kind of change, right? Because there are a lot of people, understandably, who are living in situations where change is just not that possible. And I did a video about this pretty recently that I posted on YouTube, like what, what's available to people in terms of their restricted real lives, whether that involves raising a kid, having a certain kind of job, all of those things we were talking about at the beginning about how sometimes authenticity is not called for in your situation because it's not safe um, or it, you just really can't express yourself in that way for whatever reason. And so if it's possible to develop an environment or develop a situation that you feel reasonably secure in. And sometimes that situation can be a relationship that you were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, Dad, like with somebody who gives you that unconditional positive regard. Sometimes it could be a particular kind of environment that you feel more comfortable being authentic in. Um, you see this particularly to give an example of it in queer communities, where there are certain kinds of spaces where there's just greater acceptance and freedom of the wholeness of an individual. So there are people who are comfortable being their authentic selves in those environments, and they would understandably not feel comfortable being that way out in the uh, general population, in part because it's just not safe to do that a lot of the time. And so whatever that environment is to you, when you're in that place, you can use it as a kind of testing ground for what really is authentic. What, how do you feel internally in that space? What are those body sensations? What are those questions that come up? Huh, what are the parts of yourself that are kind of coming more to the surface in this environment that maybe aren't showing up in the rest of your life? And then are there little opportunities in the rest of your life to bring those things a little bit more to the surface? Maybe not like the top 10% of them, but some aspect of them that would be kind of safe to reveal in those other circumstances. And I think that can be a really interesting way to discover those kind of more becoming aspects of this. So a couple of things here. So first off, I want to just reiterate what you said there a second ago, and we've said a few times elsewhere in here, which is that this whole business of being authentic, we've approached it in a classic Western, particularly American cultural frame in which uh, there's a valuing of individualism and the needs of the individual uh, with a strong emphasis there, uh, letting the chips fly where they may, you know, just be yourself, right? There's a thing there. Yeah. And also, uh, we're speaking from also a culture as well in which it varies, but there isn't necessarily such intense regulation of social roles as we might find in other parts of the world or in, in including more traditional cultures. 
And so you and I are kind of in a frame of in which there's an implicit presumption of a certain maneuvering room or freedom. And in self-expression. Often yeah, or not. Totally. Yeah. So we're, yeah. we're speaking from that yeah. as we're privileged or that context. So just really acknowledging that to, to be absolutely, you know, clear about it. Uh, the second thing that I think of about it, about this, is to keep bringing it down to examples that where there's kind of like, it feels like almost friction between who you really are, or who you really want to be, and who you got to be out there in the world. And then how do we manage that? And sometimes I think healthiness is to um, live with a lot of constraint in certain roles. Like you have a duty to taking care of an aging parent who's dementing and they're acting in all in various ways. Maybe they're losing self-regulation and they're getting very angry and, uh, and irrational and demanding and paranoid and and it's a real pain. It's, it's, it's irritating and frustrating to take care of them, but it's totally inappropriate to lash out at your dear mom or dear dad who's just slowly losing their mind. So what do you do? Well, maybe what you have to do is you have to wear the mask and then look for places where you can take the mask off and maybe vent and mm -hmm. get some stuff off your chest I mean, go to the top of the mountain and yell to the stars, get it off your chest. So then you can go back yeah. and play the role again. Yeah, those spaces I was talking role. about that allow for that more authentic yeah. expression. Totally. Yeah. 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 And I think a good marker for this, again, talking about the becoming aspect of it, is intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. Like, what are you intrinsically motivated towards? What are the pursuits that feel really good? inside of you that you would do even if nobody else was watching versus the ones that are driven by other people appraising you or viewing you in a certain kind of way or you want to present this certain aspect of yourself out to them. Intrinsic motivation is almost inherently authentic in nature, right? It's a from us, about us, to us. It's not driven by those external perceptions, whereas more extrinsic, extrinsic forms of motivation really are. So just kind of like seeing if you can identify or separate your pursuits in life, the more intrinsically motivated ones from the more extrinsically motivated ones. And extrinsic motivation is a totally great thing, to be clear. Um, I'm mm -hmm. extrinsically motivated in all different kinds of ways. But hey, kind of knowing what's falling into column A versus column B can be a good uh, indicator of authentic opportunities for you, including yeah. those authentic opportunities for self-expression and growth that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I think here too is the question of timing. In mm -hmm. other words, it could well be, um, including as people age, that certain things that were authentically important to them that needed to be sidelined year after year after year, you get to a point where you say to yourself, sidelining no longer, mm -hmm. or I really need mm -hmm. to listen to that part of me, or I did my job. You know, I, I played the role, I did it fine, and now this is my time, <laughs> you know, in a certain sense, uh, to put it a certain way. And I think there's a place for that. I also think that, you know, part of what's cool for us is you're coming at this from a very 21st century, uh, up to the minute <laughs> understanding of the psychological literature. And I'm coming at this. I'm trying at least. I'm trying, yeah. Yeah. A lot so informed by my own roots and the culture and the the changes and the, the orientation of the 60s. In that context, boy, I think about some classic notions such as uh, in Jungian psychology of the shadow, that which is disowned, that which is warded off. And part of authenticity is about reclaiming that part. Yeah. You know? Uh, which has, for me, been a really useful part of my journey. Another thing that I find useful, somewhat informed by uh, the sort of the imagination and, and uh, a mythopoetic perspective from that, that includes archetypes and of various kinds, is to just sort of think about the part of yourself that uh, fits different archetypes, mm. right? And I had a conversation with your mom once uh, before you were born, before we were even married, in which I got in touch with a part of myself I called the woodsman, mm -hmm. who really just sort of wanted to be alone in the wilderness. Mm 
and maybe have a little cottage somewhere at the headwaters of some creek and just kind of living alone. Yeah? And it freaked her out initially. Uh, but I needed to acknowledge there was that part of me, which I satisfied in much more modest ways by going for walks <laughs> in the woods by myself. And yeah, sure. just Sometimes a long drive, uh, you know, and occasionally a week or two. I, I want to I want to pull out part of what you're saying here, Dad, that I actually think is like really important to this whole okay. thing. So, because we're talking about the becoming part, right? Like yeah. becoming more authentic. What does that mean? Not to throw a wrench into this whole thing, but act can be authentic. And I think that that's what you're describing here. You found a part of your interior mm -hmm. that was true to you, but felt quite divorced from what you thought of as your self-concept at the time. Like it was a part of it, but it wasn't being included in that, in that self-concept. So you went through a, through a masking where you wore the mask of the woodsman, quote unquote, this character inside of yourself, to really try to live from it so that you could then include it more in your whole self-concept. That's really cool <laughs> for starters. A, that's really cool. And B, I, I was just thinking as you were talking, like, oh my God, I could get so much value out of this. Cause they're they're so to to put you uh to put my version of it. Um I sometimes joke with Elizabeth that there's this part of me that, man, I just really wish I could like grow carrots or something. I just live on a farm, grow my crops. And the reason for this is because then you have a really clear view of when you've done a good job and when you've done a bad job. Yeah. Do the crops grow? Do the, not, do the crops not grow? <laughs> you have very straightforward. I, I'm, to be clear, I'm not trying to oversimplify what it's like to be a farmer. I'm just saying in my very, very, yeah. you know, probably inaccurate notion of the whole thing. You know, you go, you do the work, you plant the seeds. It's hard work, but it's very direct. And there's a part of me that kind of longs for that in a world of very abstract targets and download numbers and how many unique visitors you're getting on a, you know, all of this like very black box kind of stuff. Man, there's a part of me that just wants to pull a damn carrot from the ground. But if I like, I'm trying to find the right way to put this. If I, but if I ask myself like, well, Forrest, what is, what is that part one? I'm like, whoa, huh? That's like, that's not integrated into my self concept, but I could imagine myself putting on that act and going, okay, what is this aspect? What would be fulfilling for it today? You know, what would feel good acting from that part of myself? It's a little bit of a mask that I'm wearing. I'm kind of playing a character, but it's also true to me in a sense. And I think that that, that integration of those two opposites that we've been talking about today is really interesting, actually, Dad, and it's probably going to be pre personally useful for me. That's great for us that you could so quickly perceive that piece of it, the ways in which when we're starting to discover or get in touch with a part of ourselves, it can help to over-dramatize it. Yeah, totally. To to actually explore it and to inhabit it and be more comfortable with it and then gradually integrate it so it 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 joins the cast of characters around the table, but it's not being bossy about all that. That's a great simplification of my kind of rambling, rambling monologue there for yeah. a moment. But I just think that that's such a cool and useful tool. And I'm definitely gonna gonna think about ways to apply that. And I, I would really offer that to people to think about, huh, what's like a part of yourself that that feels true to you, but that you've had kind of a hard time integrating for whatever reason. Like the notion of acting from it feels kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. It's you just you don't really know what that would look like practically. It feels sort of obtuse it's like well can you actually wear that mask for a minute like what would that be like um and just try it on in kind of a way that feels safe for you yeah, great stuff i mean man this is one of those topics where huh. we could do another five episodes on that's right audit and and all of the all of the related things to talk about here um but i really enjoyed this one dad i thought this was really interesting i hope other people found it interesting it was a little bit more abstract than some of the things that we talk about but this is the kind of stuff that fascinates me so i hope that people got some real value from it yeah me too and, and again if it seemed too swirly just keep bringing it back is there something important you're feeling these days that would be that would serve you and maybe others to express more fully uh Second, uh, are there important needs that you have that are just not being fully met that also would serve you uh, to express more fully? And last, are there important aspirations, longings, visions in you um, that are not getting an outlet as much as they could these days? And what, what might be helpful for you there? That'll tend to ground all this and bring it down to earth.
Great summary, Dad. I might have you do the recap for this one. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best I had. <laughs> I really loved today's conversation with Rick, which focused on what it actually means to be ourselves. And because this episode uh, was a little bit more abstract, and we talked about a lot of different things during it, I'm going to do my best here at the end to kind of summarize the story of what we talked about, as opposed to the more specific points. And then along the way, I'll mention some things that really stood out to me. At the very beginning of the conversation, I asked Rick what authenticity means to him. And he really focused on what I'll call subjective feelings of authenticity. The sense that there's something truer inside of ourselves that just isn't coming to the surface for whatever reason. And we're going to go through a kind of deliberate process of trying to live that truer thing out into the world. And he also mentioned things like uh, dropping the act or lowering the mask that we have in front of ourselves or generally just clearing the impediments that we have to more authentic forms of self-expression. And this makes sense because, for starters, Rick is a longtime therapist. He really cares about the internal world of the person. And also he really situated those views socially and culturally in the 1960s with the beat poets and the be true to yourself man and this kind of counter-cultural moment in time. But these days when people are trying to research authenticity, They need to create a construct. They need to create a thing that authenticity is that we can all kind of agree on. And many people have argued that authenticity is a really poorly defined construct and has all of these different issues with it. For starters, people tend to focus on the notion of congruence. In other words, how similar our internal world is to the way that we act externally. And people are authentic when a particular behavior that they're expressing out in the world is congruent with their underlying attitudes or beliefs, values, motives, whatever else they got going on inside of themselves. And that's taken from a piece titled The Enigma of Being Yourself, A Critical Examination of the Concept of Authenticity. Then when people talk colloquially about authenticity, there's often this suggestion that there's this kind of true self or more real version of ourselves that is just lying beneath the surface. And it's it's one thing. And if we were just authentic to that one thing, our lives would get a lot easier. Then when people talk about authenticity, they also often suggest that authenticity is just a good thing, that we should all be aspiring to be more authentic. And then finally, the feeling of authenticity when people, again, talk about it more casually, is this different sort of feeling than just feeling good. It's not so much about feeling good because being authentic often involves stretching ourselves in these different kinds of ways, living into a truer version of ourselves can create friction, and so on and so on. The problem is that kind of all of these things that I just named, that notion of behavioral congruence, authenticity is different from just feeling good, Uh, there's one unified true self, and we should just like live in alignment with that true self, and then also being authentic is a good thing, period. All of those things have problems with them. Uh, We know from IFS and other basic models of the mind that people are fragmented. They have a lot of different wants and needs. They've got a lot of different parts of themselves. Is there really one kind of unified true self beneath it all? Hmm, Maybe if you believe in that spiritually or something like that. But psychologically, it's really hard to argue that. Then if you dig into the research, what you find is most of the time people feel authentic not when their uh, external behavior is congruent with the way they are. Research has found that most of the time, people feel authentic just when they feel good. Like, behaving congruently with your traits has a very little to do with our sense of authenticity. And then finally, authenticity is not a purely good thing on its own. And we talked a lot about this during the conversation. Authenticity is driven by the circumstance that you're in, how safe that circumstance is, what your underlying values are. Uh, Frankly, there are a lot of people out there where I'm not sure that I want them behaving authentically. And some of those people probably don't want me behaving authentically. But we have to get along with each other to live in a vaguely functional society. And so all of these things together make authenticity kind of a squirrely knot to interact with. It's hard to say what we mean by it actually. It's really hard to study it. And a lot of the conventional notions that we have about authenticity just aren't true. And then for the rest of the conversation, we focused on 
finding something that felt authentic about authenticity, a, a way that we could think about it that felt both like true to our experience and something that we could articulate during a podcast episode. And Rick really focused more again on that subjective experience of authenticity, this feeling that there's something being left out. And this is somewhat consistent with Carl Rogers and his view of the ideal self versus the perceived self. And he suggested that one of the major targets of therapy is aligning the perceived with the ideal, creating this congruence between those two versions of ourself. And Rick kind of squirmed around this a little bit because the word ideal is a really tricky word. Whose ideals are we targeting? Why do we care about those ideals? What are we actually trying to do here? But if you go back to the original language from Rogers, you find that what he was talking about and what my dad was talking about really do kind of line up nicely, the sort of more humanistic view of what we're trying to accomplish here. And we focused on two tracks. The first being authentic which is about really dropping the mask in these different ways. Uh, moving away from a false version of ourselves, becoming more intrinsically motivated towards our pursuits, including various aspects of ourselves that maybe we've left out until now. And then the second track, becoming authentic, where we're trying to live into a more aspirational version of ourselves that is still authentic, is still true to who we are, but it's maybe in the upper 10 to 20% of the range. And this positions authenticity as at least somewhat aspirational in nature. It's a little bit about self-realization because we can think back to the times where we described ourselves as feeling authentic. And yes, those are times where we just felt good, for sure. But what else is a piece of that? Most of the time when I hear people describe feeling authentic, they're talking about a moment where they felt like the best version of themselves, where they felt like they were in that top 10% of the range, where, you know, maybe it wasn't the way that they are every single day, but hey, if I were that way more often, man, that would feel pretty good to me. And then we closed with many different ways that people can go about the task of both being authentic and becoming more authentic. I'm not going to talk about all of them here. Rick mentioned a number of different things, but I want to flag one from each category. First, Rick really emphasized the role of sensation in being authentic, particularly for people who have kind of a hard time sensing down into themselves and exploring their interior. One thing we can do is focus on physical sensations. What's your body telling you? What are the, some people might call them the gut feelings that you're having? What are literally the uh, differences in your heart rate and how you're breathing in different kinds of circumstances? Those can give you a lot of hints toward how you're actually feeling inside, which can then reveal maybe a more authentic part of yourself. The second thing I want to highlight, which was more about becoming, was Rick's idea at the end there about uh, adopting a persona in the pursuit of becoming more authentic, which I thought was this really interesting finessing of kind of bringing the act together with authenticity and using act in service of authenticity. Because I've definitely got parts of myself where they both feel like a really true part of me and also something that feels like kind of at arm's length. That's kind of over there. I'm over here. I don't really know how to get into that. Yeah, it's something I would kind of like, but ew, the practicality of it feels a little messy. And so can we wear that character as a kind of mask from time to time? Can we think of it as a role that we are putting on, that we are embodying? What would that part of ourselves want more? What would feel good to it? Uh, what's a way that it can express itself that is also somewhat culturally and morally and situationally appropriate? You know, how can we uh, go and grow our carrots, as I talked about, without actually, you know, uprooting our backyard? And who knows, maybe there's a planter box in my future over here. But I just thought it was a really interesting way to think about this whole thing. So that's today's episode on authenticity. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, this one was one of the ones that I find really personally interesting. But I'm, I, I hope that other people feel that way too. But it's just really easy for this stuff to become uh, pretty theoretical pretty quickly. And that can just get very squirrely in how we talk about it. And so I am really curious to hear from you how you felt about this episode. So if you're watching it on YouTube, you can easily leave a comment down below. If you're listening to it, you can leave a rating and a review on the podcast. 
uh, hopefully a positive rating. Even if you didn't love this episode, I would really appreciate that. And if you want to reach out in other ways, you can send an email to contact at beingwellpodcast.com. And even though I can't respond to everything, I read pretty much every email that we receive. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for just a couple dollars a month, you can support the show and get a bunch of bonuses in return. These are things like expanded show notes that I do for some episodes, add free versions of what we create, and transcripts of the episodes as well. So again, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.